So I want to respond to a question about the power of awareness and love and the and the role or the way in which sadness and other emotions that we often refer to as negative show up in our worlds. So awareness has the ability to see what is. And sometimes when we focus on what is, it's not always pleasant. And when there's loss or when there is a tragedy, when there are, uh, when institutions trusted or have said, had some confidence in are falling apart when there's a lot of, of change and there's a tremendous amount of instability. There's all kinds of things that can come, can come up. Sadness can come up. Anger can come up. Uh, when we're in the middle of uh, climate chaos, um, when we're in a crisis, there's all kinds of things that come up, include we have to navigate often a lot of trauma. And so the awareness of these things um, helps us illuminate what is and in addition to illuminating what is we are also in a position to be able to respond skillfully to what is so when we're in an emergency situation then awareness directs our capacity to make choices about what are the immediate next steps that we need to do to secure our own safety and to secure the safety of the people that are around us and so um that is one of the functions that awareness gives us. It gives us the ability to know what's going on, to be able to be attentive to our responses of that, and then to be able to find a way of, of bringing clarity to our actions to be able to make wise responses in that context. So this is a, the second part of the, of the live Facebook that I did before, which was responding to the question. And I realized that I didn't answer the question about, is it possible to be loving when you see so much going on in the world that is so uninspiring? You see so many examples of people that are not being loving, that are not being wise, that are not being compassionate. And, and so there's a question, you know, is it possible to actually be loving? Is it possible that any kind path of practice is going to generate a good result. And so when we're caught in the middle of feeling uh, despondent, despairing, and, and seeing the amount of things that are going on around us that are unskillful, it's easy for us to get lost in the power of the doubt. And um, I, remember, I remember a story that my father told, told, told me and my brother when we were young. He said, you know, if you're if you're on a beach and there's a hundred other kids that are on the beach and someone sees out in the distance a dolphin swimming, and then one kid says, That's a fish. And then you say, Well, no, it's not a fish. It's actually a mammal. And so a hundred kids line up and they vote and and they all decide that it's actually a fish. But the the truth is not actually up to vote. <laughs> So the scientific classification of a dolphin is not a fish. And so the reality of the nature of the mind is not based on the, the, the examples of the people around us. It's actually based on the truth of the way things are. And so when we are in the middle of unsettling situations or disillusioned situations or uninspiring situations, or when we feel hard, heartbroken or when we're navigating trauma, it's often the lens that we are looking through. And through that lens, we see all of the reasons that support us feeling that way. It's a lens that reinforces itself. And so in biology, there's an expression, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. I may have got, got it backwards. Phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. I can't remember. But what you start out with will be what you end up with. And the same is true with our minds. When we start out with sadness, unless we are discerning in the way we are relating to that sadness, then we will end up with more sadness. If we start out with disillusionment, if we start out with our heart broken, then it becomes the lens that we look through and it is something that we will then see all of the reasons around us that will support us feeling sad and disillusioned and heartbroken. 
that's the nature of dependent co-arising that when we see something it conditions our ability to see the same thing again and that is why it's incredibly important that we understand the role of discernment in the way that we follow our thoughts and our feelings and our moods and our mind states because when we are looking through a lens of sadness then the result is almost always that what we see is sadness and so it is not the result of spiritual mastery to like our friends and to dislike the people that we don't like every ordinary person is capable of doing that but it does take spiritual development to be able to have some reflective awareness and spaciousness with our friends, with our loved ones. And it takes some skill to be able to look and to see the positive qualities in people that are doing things that are harmful, that we don't just objectify them as the enemy. And so when we understand the spiritual training, the muscles of the mind that are needed in order to turn our mind towards the clarity of knowing rather than the object of what is known. When we have practice doing that, then we can see that when everything else falls away, when we're, we're done with the emotions, the emotions all come and go, they come and go, they come and go, there's sadness and there's joy and there's excitement and then there's quiet and then there's despair and then there's curiosity and there's happiness they all have a lifespan and then they go but when we are able to touch in to the stillness that is underneath everything the awareness that holds and receives everything when we have experiences of the mind's opening to a fundamental consciousness a pervasive awareness and when we recognize that in, in that experience of pervasive awareness, awareness is not generated by me. It's not something that I do. It's something that I rest in. And it's something that is I rest in because it is everywhere. Well, that awareness is also the other side of love. That love is not just an attitude that I bring of being kind, of being friendly, of the intention not to harm when I'm filled up with thoughts that I wanna kill somebody, you know, that I wanna murder somebody. It's an act of love to not follow that. But more than the action of the way I am believing my thoughts, love is the other side of awareness. It's an embracing quality that suffuses who and what I am and is everything. Now, granted, I don't see that and experience that all the time. It's something that I have access to periodically. But when I have access, when I do touch into that, when I do feel and connect with pervasive awareness and this love that is transcending time and space, then I recognize that that is fundamentally what I am made out of. And so whether everything is good or bad or incredibly challenging, and, you know, life can be incredibly challenging. I get it. You know, I have had a few experiences myself I could share, you know. It's easy to get stuck in the mind states that are connected to the story. But when we use our meditation to drop into the witnessing and we stop being mesmerized by the fluctuating moods and thoughts that we have and our mind opens to awareness that is pervasive. And in that pervasive awareness, there's also love. And when we know that, it's not a question of whether we believe it or not. It's not a question of whether we think the practice is useful or not. It's a direct experience that recognizes that beyond the changing mind states, 
is something that is stable and holding and resting. That's peaceful, that's profound, that's loving. And that is true and exists simultaneously, even if I don't have access to it, when things are going on around me that are worthy of concern, of doubt, of heartbreak. And so the mastery, the meditation mastery, is to have access to that all the time, not as a way of dismissing what is concerning and heart, but as a way of anchoring ourselves into something that is so deep and profound that it gives us the energy and the resource to show up again and again and again and again and again and again and again in whatever ways we are called to to give voice to that rather than believe and follow the voices of heartbreak air and despondency so whatever we are called to in this world in terms of our mission and our path it is our connection our deep connection which connects us to the web of life, which connects us to the interconnection of all of beings, of all of life. That is where our source and our strength comes from. And when we're connected to that, then it's easier, not easy, easier to find the resiliency to navigate this stuff, which is heartbreaking and is going on all around us all the time. So this is the second part of the question that was asked in the letter that I read earlier about what's the point of awareness and love and is it something possible? And that is really up to each of us individually in our own practice to develop the skill and the mastery that we can touch into timeless, ever-present awareness and its correlate of unconditioned love, no matter where we are and no matter what's going on. And for that, it's often incredibly useful to have community, to have teachers, to have regular practice, to have mentors, to have support, and to have retreats so that we can remember and be supported in doing this regularly. So bye for now.